Hey guys, Tisha here, and we are back for a reading. Now, I had asked in my previous readings what you all want to read, and there were two books mentioned. Um, the book from the catfish, following uh, Sister Wives, and then the book from the Dargers who appeared on Sister Wives. I have been unable to locate the full version of the catfish book. It says unavailable, even on Kindle. It's $5 on Kindle, but it's unavailable. So I said, all right, we're going to still roll with something. And we're going to be reading Love Times 3, which is the story of the Dargers who did appear on the Browns. If you've never been to one of my videos where I read, I'm warning you now, I don't pronounce things correctly. <laughs> I stumble over my words. I get tongue tied and I interject with my opinion based on maybe the sentence that I might have read. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to interject in this because we're not that familiar with this family, but I'm still going to give my input. We're going to try to do a chapter at a time. I have not looked through the book to see how long the chapters are, but that seemed to work for the previous book that I read. So hopefully it will work with this one as well. So let's begin. A note to the readers. In the past, people like us who have polygamous relationships have zealously guarded their privacy and sought to stay out of the public spotlight due to this lifestyle's criminal status. We have stayed silent despite widespread mis or misinterpretations, mistreatment, and intolerance. To speak up is to risk persecution, prosecution, and because of discrimination, economic hardship. We have carried the fragile hope that our silence will allow us to avoid unfair treatment. As a family, we have come to see that as unproductive and naive. Real and fictional events have combined to create a public portrait of our culture that is often inaccurate at times, harmful, which has led to our decision to, sh to share our story despite the risk. We hope to correct fallacies spread through statements that typically begin, all polygamists are, a blank field in which abusive, uneducated, oppressed, and numerous other terms. Ooh. Such broad brush swipes are no more accurate than characterizing all monogamous based on the abusive behavior of the actor Charlie Sheen or the infidelity of golfer Tiger Woods. Ooh, -wee, they coming in hot. <laughs> In speaking about our lives, we don't mean to deny the voice of others who have had a bad experience in polygamy. As with monogamy, there are some plural marriages that don't work out. We've seen that with the sister wives now, haven't we? And there are practices in some groups that we don't agree with or believe are keeping with the ideals of our faith. I think that would be like the FLDS, the Kingston family. Nor do we claim to represent any other family's experience, though we know many families who, like us, have successful faith-based plural marriages. This is simply our truth. In telling our story, we relied on, journaly, on journals, family histories, our own memories, and individual interpretations of certain events. We have withheld names of some individuals to protect their privacy. We want to be clear on one point. We are independents, the largest category of fundamentalist Mormons who believe plural marriage is an essential religious tenet. Historical roots aside, we have no association whatsoever with any organized polygamous group or with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS. Since 1890, the LDS Church has issued numerous official declarations and statements denouncing plural marriage and has disavowed any connection with fundamentalists. Some have asked whether polygamy is viable in our modern culture. Our answer, yes, absolutely. Ours is an example of a family created by consenting adults for whom this lifestyle works. At its core, this is a love story about people who came together to create a family that would support, 
nurture, and sustain each member. Every day, people make bonds and blend relationships in ways that are redefining what it means to be family. I will agree with that statement because I have friends that I consider family, so I can see that. Our particular redefinition is nothing new. However, polygamy is the most widespread family structure in the world, permissible in more cultures historically than any other. In choosing plural marriage, we have found purpose that goes beyond ourselves, sometimes in ways we never could have imagined. As we built a family based on the most traditional of values, faith, love, loyalty, and unconditional acceptance, the Dargers. All right, y'all, that's their note to us. Their introduction is a matter of principle and it says Joe, so I'm gonna assume that this is the husband speaking. The house was quiet, the younger children finally in bed as I made my way to the family room and turned on the television. For weeks, I had been hearing about the finale for the first season of HBO's series about polygamy, Big Love. That evening, as the episode began, I felt a panicky, butterflies in the stomach sensation. HBO was about to showcase an event plucked from my own life. I wonder when Big Love came out. I don't know. I never watched it. If you know, put it down below. Because notice he's not talking about the Browns. He's talking about a show that was on HBO. That's the first thing that that I, I'm wondering. I am a polygamist. I live in a suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah with my three wives, Alina, Vicky, and Valerie, and our 23 living children. I own a business, coach Little League sports teams, and I am heavily involved with my extended family. But I bet you are stuck on that first sentence. Yes, I am a polygamist. Surprisingly, I'm not. I'm not stuck on that first sentence. Are you guys? I am what some refer to as Joseph Smith Mormon. In other words, I am a part of the religious movement known as Mormonism, but I do not belong to any church or follow any leader. So they follow Joseph Smith, so did the Browns, but they're not in the same thing. Okay, because he's not in a church. Um, some people erroneously refer to me as a polygamist the same way some one else might be called a Catholic or a Buddhist, but there is much more to my beliefs than the way I've chosen to structure my family. Many people are surprised when they meet us and they learn we are polygamous. Strangers expect my wife to be dressed in conservative clothing and have their hair in French braids, not dressed fashionably with stylish haircuts and makeup and jobs and children in public school. The fact is that majority of polygamous families are just as mainstream as we are. I think that they may have felt that way in the beginning, but since certain shows and the internet and learning things for ourselves, I don't think everyone still feels that way, which is making me want to know when this book was written. I'll look into that later. Um, Alina. Vicky and I have been married for more than 21 years. Valerie joined the family 11 years ago, bringing five children from her first marriage. Our lives revolve around fundamentalist Mormon faith in our children, and we do have a bunch of them. We have six college-age children, 14 children in grade school, and three preschoolers, including Victoria, who at one is the newest addition to the family. We sometimes need a dolly to hold the groceries during weekly shopping trips to Costco. I bet. Uh, <laughs> Sunday brunches are huge affairs that typically involve five dozen eggs, gallons of milk and juice, and too many waffles to count. My weekend honeydew list is often pages long, and my wives have had to become master strategists in order to keep track of who needs to be where and when. My family may be bigger than most and my relationships more complex. I have to admit, I sometimes have trouble tracking whose turn it is for date night. But in reality, our lives aren't much different from those of our neighbors. I don't have time to watch much television. And to be honest, I don't care for the content of most cable shows. If it weren't for the P word, I wouldn't have been tuning into HBO that night in June 2006. Oh... 
So this was before the Browns came on TV that the big love th thing came out. Okay, he just answered my question. In fact, I was shocked when I first learned that HBO was doing a series about polygamous family and I expected the worst. I figured the show would make us out to be a bunch of cooks, of kooks. At the time, there was a lot of national media attention focused on polygamous sect in Utah, whose leader had been accused of crimes and was then in hiding. But my curiosity about the show and my hope that it would offer a fair treatment of my culture increased when I learned that Big Love's creators, Mark Olson and Will Schaefer, drew some of their first inspiration from a magazine called Mormon Focus. The first cover issue shows virtually this family, the suburban integrated family. So it's not a connotation. Olson told media during a publicity tour for Big Love, there was only a single issue of Mormon Focus published in 2003, and it featured my three wives on the cover. Two stories in the magazine intended for a fundamentalist Mormon audience were about my family, though we were identified only by pseudonyms. We agreed to participate in the debate in the debut issue after praying about it as a family and we were scared about the fallout but there wasn't any at least not as far as we could tell when the magazine folded after the initial issue we wondered why we had been so strongly inspired to do it now several years later was big love our answer there was no doubt that the show was going to bring polygamy into the public sphere probably in ways we could never have imagined so i knew that the show's creators were familiar with how our family lived. But as Big Love rolled out in 2006, I was unnerved. With each new episode, I wondered who is the inside person feeding them information. Much of what was depicted in the series about the main character and his family seemed to parallel and even mirror my life to the extent that no matter how strongly we denied it, many friends and relatives assumed we were the secret informants for the show. No one in my family had met with or spoken with Big Love's creators or any of his staff, but still the suspicion that we were involved grew, especially among fundamentalists who were uncomfortable with the show's portrayal of our lifestyle. And then came the season one entitled The Ceremony, in which the polygamous lifestyle of one wife is revealed after she is named a Beehive Mother of the Year. It's a true story. It happened to my mother. In 1999, Governor Michelle and his wife, Jacqueline, paid tribute to 25 remarkable mothers from throughout Utah. I nominated my mother, who had started a catering business to support her family after my father, who had four wives, died in 1995. So he was born into it. Her daily heroism both inspires me and epitomizes the high office of motherhood. I wrote in my nomination letter, I was 26, the oldest of my father's 17 children when he passed away. My mother had 10 children, six of whom were still at home, and she was determined to take care of them without putting a burden on others. My mother took the asset she had, great people skills, a big kitchen, and experience feeding large groups of people and put them all to work. She taught several major vendors into choosing her company as their preferred provider. Like many children, I did not always agree with my mother's choices, but I saw her as a great example of a strong woman and of a mother who was willing to do all she could to provide for her children. Y'all, I'm a little bored right now, but <laughs> I'm gonna keep it going because this is just the intro. My mother was chosen as one of the state's remarkable mothers and on the day of the awards luncheon was featured in a full page ad in the Salt Lake Tribune with the other mothers who were being recognized. That's when things blew up. A tipster alerted the governor's staff that they had picked a plural wife for recognition. I was seated with two of my siblings and our mother in a room at the governor's mansion waiting for the luncheon ceremony to begin when a grim-faced staff aide approached with whispered in my mother's ear and led her away. I had a sickening feeling, what had I done? When I nominated her, I had naive, naively hoped that polygamy wouldn't be an issue and that my mother would be judged on her accomplishments as a businesswoman and parent. My mother was taken to a woman's restroom where the aide asked if she was a plural wife. 
Moments later, another aide collected my siblings and me and took us to the same restroom. A reporter from the Salt Lake Tribune, sensing something newsworthy, was posted outside the door hoping for a scoop. I had never been in a woman's restroom, which added to the awkwardness. It took just one look at my mother's ashen face to confirm that her history as a poor wife has surfaced. It's a shame that they handled it this way. Feel whatever way you want to feel, but to embarrass the lady by removing her from the room, bringing her into the bathroom, and then bringing her her children, one of which who happens to be a male, in that bathroom, that was a bit much. But no one knew what to do, apparently. The governor's staff had two equally bad options, pay tribute to a polygamist or retract the award. Either choice was sure to generate controversy. The governor, who, by the way, had polygamous ancestors, already had drawn criticism for saying that Utah was not going to persecute polygamists aggressively for legal reasons and that the practice of polygamy might fall under First Amendment protection. He then had to backtrack from those comments. Now this, are you prepared to come out publicly as a plural wife? Do you realize that would mean for your family? The aide asked my mother. There was silence. I quickly ran through the options in my mind. What if my mother declined the award and walked away, I offered. I realized that would spare my mother's embarrassment and allow the governor to avoid a media circus focused on polygamy rather than on the deserving mothers gathered in the other room. Would you do that? The aide asked, relief sweeping across her face. Moments later, my mother, siblings, and I left through a side door at the governor's mansion with the news photographer snapping away and the reporter firing off questions as we ran to our car. I'm declining the award, my mother told the reporter. The only thing I could do to think to say was no comment, no comment, no comment, no comment over and over. The headline in the Salt Lake Tribune the next day read, Polygamous mom slips out back door of ceremony. Other media soon picked up the story and we were inundated with requests for interviews, which terrified us. A dozen years ago, polygamy was as explosive as a topic as it is today. I don't know how Big Love came across the story, but there is no doubt that the producers recognized its dramatic potential. Alina, Vicky, and Valerie settled in beside me on our oversized leather couch that night to watch the show's interpretation of the event. Valerie wasn't part of the family back in 1999, so while she knew the basic story, she had lots of questions as we watched. Is that how it really happened? Who was there? What did you do? What did you say? It was an intense hour for me. I had tears in my eyes through most of the episode as the fears and feelings I experienced long ago flooded black, back. That had to be kind of traumatic. Even though at the time I think he was 20 something, that still had to be traumatic because not only did he risk outing his mom, but he didn't mean to do that when he tried to get her that award. <sighs> Vicky didn't rush around our house closing curtains the way one of the wives did in the season finale but for a while she was sick with worry that the state might investigate us learning we were polygamous and take away our children whenever the phone rang during the days after the awards luncheon we didn't dare answer it we feared it might be yet another reporter calling I was uneasy when I went to work the day after the story broke had my co-workers heard about my mom and the decline of the war the award what would they think it didn't take long for a boss to approach me and say he'd seen the news to my great relief he added that's just not right the big love episode captured all the things I felt at the time hurt fear isolation and tenderness for my family it accurately showed how polygamists like me have sought to keep our lives private and have learned to smoothly change the subject or give indirect answers to questions that dig too deep. Those are the times a knot grows in your stomach, one caused by fear of the unknown, the fear that once someone knows about your lifestyle, they'll treat you differently. With revulsion and suspicion, our consequential plural relationships are considered a crime, even though we do not seek state-issued marriage licenses for them. The Remarkable Mothers event was my first experience with public intolerance of polygamy as an adult, but it certainly wouldn't be my last. Indeed, just two years later, I faced a personal tragedy that was worsened by prejudicial views of my lifestyle. 
that must have been when his daughter died because I remember on the show, um, his wife talked about how their baby who was a few months old had passed. So I think that's where we're going with this. Um, in March, 2001, yep, my five month old daughter, Kyra died. Alina, her mother and I would learn later on that our daughter had undiagnosed internal birth defects that compromised her health, but we had no idea that March night why Kyra had stopped breathing. We rushed her to the hospital in such shock that we did not realize she had already passed away. This was the beginning of our heartbreak and also of our nightmare. What should have been a routine investigation turned into a probe of our lifestyle and insinuations that our religious beliefs played a role in our daughter's death. I remember when they were on the show and they were talking about this, how upset I got because the Browns tried to act like they were facing a real investigation when these people actually went through one and their fears were valid. In the midst of our devastating loss, my family suffered the unjustified scrutiny of our lifestyle often attracts. Ultimately, through the investigation that followed, Kyra's death did not divide our family or break us. Instead, it started us on the road to activism to fight anti-polygamy biases. Once Big Luck began to air, we were further moved to action. Through its five seasons, I watched the show take on my religion and culture with recognition, amusement, and sometimes disgust. Mostly, it sharpened my feelings that people from within the culture needed to tell their story. But it was another series of events involving a fundamentalist sect that finally solidified our desire as a family to be those people. Those events came to head on April 3rd, 2008, when law enforcement officers raided the Yearning for Zion Ranch in El Dorado, Texas, home to a members of a sect known as the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, FLDS. News of what was happening in the small West Texan town didn't leak out until the next morning, but it then spread like wildfire among the Fundamentalist Mormons who can be found mostly from Mexico to Canada, California to Missouri. I was already at work when my cell phone rang at 7 a.m. Have you heard what's happening in Texas? A friend asked. Her voice tinged with anxiety. Details were sketchy. She knew only that hundreds of law enforcement officers and child welfare workers were at the ranch. For many of us, it was 1953 all over again. That's when Arizona officials raided the polygamous community then known as Short Creek, which straddled the Utah-Arizona state line. Law enforcers removed 153 children, leaving behind those on Utah's side of the town. Officials initially planned to separate the children from their families and place them in adoptive homes, a proposal that deflated almost as soon as it was launched because of the nationwide criticism of state's action. I, I feel like we can agree to disagree with whatever is happening as far as polygamy is concerned. If you do an investigation and you do not see that there is any harm being done to these children, if you do not see the whole child bride situation or molestations or things of that nature, I don't feel like they should be forced to be removed from the home. I think that if, especially if they're old enough, they should be given some form of option. I guess that they thought that they were doing something right, but sometimes the system is even worse than some of these homes. Uh, officials initially planned to separate the children from their families and place them in adoptive homes. A proposal that deflated as soon as it was launched because of the nationwide criticism of the state's action. So Arizona had custody of nearly all those children along with their mothers for two years. Like many other fundamentalist Mormons, we have relatives who were swept up in the raid at Short Creek, now known as Heidel, Utah and Colorado City, Arizona. Vicki and Valerie's mother was a child during the Short Creek Raid, and the pain is still fresh all these years later when she talks about her experiences. I'm sure it did traumatize her to be separated like that from your family. That did have to be traumatizing. Her stories are a constant reminder of what can happen when you choose the polygamous lifestyle. 55 years later, as events unfolded, in Texas, we fear there would be more simultaneous raids in Utah, Arizona, and other places that are home to fundamentalist Mormons. By the third day, Texas authorities had removed 439 
children from that ranch and taken them with their mothers 45 miles away. They were initially housed at historic military fort. After a week, the women were separated from the children who were then sent to foster shelters across Texas from the Panhandle to the Gulf. As a family, we were distraught, confused, and afraid. We understood the lasting trauma the FLDS children would experience. We watched television reports and read stories about the mothers with heavy hearts. My wives were panicked when they thought of being separated from their own children and not knowing who they were with or whether they were okay. As we gathered for family prayer at night, they were often in tears as we asked God to bring healing and comfort to the hearts of both the young ones and now the childless mothers. We tried to keep our youngest children from watching the news and shielded them from most of our anxious conversations, but there was no escaping the tension and the stress we were experiencing. Could this happen to us, dad? Are you going to jail? Ashton, my nine-year-old son asked one day. He went with his mother almost once every hour to ask her, did they take, did they make the brothers and sisters go away from each other to strangers houses? My daughter, Kylie, six, who asked if law officers were doing this to everyone who has more than one mom. We had little contact with our relatives in the L FLDS sect over the years, though we had known them to be honorable people. But like most of the public, we knew virtually nothing about the group's current practices or its leaders. Warren Jeffs, other than that, we were gleaned from media reports about arranged marriages involving minors in exile, some just boys who had left or been kicked out of the church. Okay, let me say this because of my previous comments about removing the kids. If this was the stuff that was going on with, with Warren Jeffs was happening in these homes, then I take it back. Remove those children. But that's only if things are going wrong. In the years preceding the raid, the accounts we heard of their insular sect led us to begin talking about our lives, experiences, and, pu and beliefs publicly. As independent fundamentalist Mormons, our culture is vastly different, especially when it comes to marriage practices and family autonomy. Through two groups, principal voices, that's the same group that Christine was working with, um, an advocacy group and the Principal Rights Coalition, which seeks to bring the diverse universe of fundamentalist Mormons together on common ground. My family and others had empathically spoken against underage marriages and abuse of any kind. We'd also tried to help educate the public about the distinct differences found among fundamentalist Mormons. That April, as every day brought a new sensation, sensational allegation involving the FLDS, including cl claims that were later proven to be unfounded. It appeared those efforts were unraveling. I was heart sick because it seemed such a setback of what we've been trying to do. In the days following the raid, I received nonstop calls from fundamentalist Mormons who shared my family's anxiety about the news trickling out of Texas, seeing my children and the community in fear I had once thought. I have to do something. I wanted to protect and comfort, but I also was filled with purposeful anger as national media descended on Texas. I wanted to help the reporters understand the variations of Mormon fundamentalists. At the same time, I wanted to speak out against the injustice that had occurred in the way authorities had removed all the children from their mothers based on unsubstantiated claims. I fear that if we spoke out and the claims later proved true, we would be judged as sympathetic to abusive behavior. And yet, what if they weren't true and we did nothing? That is a, a, a fine line. As chairman of the Principal Rights Coalition, I called a meeting the first week of the raid. I saw fear on the faces of every person in the room. As the ideas were batted around, how to respond, I thought of how I had turned to writing so often in my own life to deal with confusion, hurt, and pain. I suggested a letter writing campaign that would connect our mothers to the FLDS mothers, our children to their children. At first, the idea was not received as warmly as I had hoped. Some coalition members pointed out that the FLDS had rejected our past efforts to reach out to them. Perhaps they would mistrust our motives now, but no one had a better proposal, so we proceeded. 
Writing letters at least gave us something to do and provided a way for our children to deal with their fears. One letter was written by a four-year-old, brought tears to my eyes. It simply said, I hope the kidnappers are nice. Four years old, being taken from officials and you're saying you hope the kidnappers are nice. That speaks to how traumatic that had to be. Several weeks after the raid, my wife Val traveled to Texas with Mary, a co-founder of Principal Voices, bearing 420 letters of support. While in Texas, Val and Mary met with media to provide another view of the polygamous lifestyle. Their message was simple. Not all polygamists are alike, and many of our families, in fact, are not much different from most monogamous families. Those were scary times for my children, my wives, and me, but the event also finally propelled my family into making a major decision. It was, we knew, time to end our silence and the time for us to share with the world what living in a polygamous family is really like. All right, y'all, that is the introduction. Let me know how you feel. I'm hoping that the, the rest of the book kind of picks up pace a little bit. This is going to be a little different because we're not really familiar with this family, but I think we can do it. And looking at this, I might be breaking up the next chap the next chapter in part A and part B because it seems like they're a little wordy when they speak. <laughs> So we'll see. You guys let me know your thoughts down below. Is this something that we want to continue to read? If not, no, I'm not a quitter, y'all. I got to be honest. I was going to say, well, we could read something else. I'm hoping that it picks up because I'm not a quitter. I'm one of those people who if I start something, I want to finish it. So my goal is going to be to finish this book. Even if that means I read a little excerpt every day. Um, we'll see. Hopefully you all like it. Let me know down below. Until next time.